Ok. Uh, oi, gente. Uh, eu sou o Rafael. Uh, estou aqui em Dartmouth. E com esse vídeo a gente começa mais um dos vídeos da série de Call com Admissions Officers. Uh, e hoje a gente vai falar aqui sobre uh, a minha faculdade com Dartmouth. Uh, aqui do meu lado tem o Greg, que trabalha no Office of Admissions. Uh, e ele vai contar um pouco mais sobre o, como é a vida aqui em Dartmouth. Uh, Fala, vai falar sobre admissions é, e tudo que você precisa saber e acho que é isso então é, but I, I was speaking in Portuguese but you're gonna do it in everything in in, in English so. well guys <laughs> beleza guys <laughs> beleza guys beleza olá uh, my name is Greg obviously as uh, Hava said I'm gonna talk to you guys today in English about opportunities here at Dartmouth um, we have a little PowerPoint that we might share with yeah. you that's gonna give like some some slides very basic but the general overview is I want to tell you some stories about opportunities at Dartmouth that you wouldn't find if you just googled Dartmouth online I don't want to you know bore you with information you could find on your own because um, I'm sure you've done a lot of research already but uh, the goal is to keep you to inform you a little bit about opportunities half us here to fill in and talk a little bit more about the student life um, my 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 idea is to answer four questions for you today. Uh, the four questions are, are who, where, what, and how. Um, so to break those down, I want to spend a little bit of time um, talking about the who because I was a history and education major as an undergraduate student. So for who, me, it's really important. where, what, so and how. On technical, technical Problems. things happening. Uh, <laughs> uh, go to slideshow. Yeah. Maybe. Is it here? There you go. Yeah, there, yeah, there we go. So the, I talk about the who for five or ten minutes. Dartmouth is a very old institution, so I'm not going to give you the full history, but I'm going to give you like an abridged version. Um, as I was saying, as a history person, I was a history teacher, high school history teacher for a long time. I think it's important to know where we've been in order to understand where we're going. So I'm going to talk about, and I just coffee everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about the history of Dartmouth, and then I'm going to talk about where we're located. I think that's very important. You guys are in. Brazil right now, I know Hava is from Sao Paulo, I'm from Miami. Uh, Dartmouth is in a place that's very different from those places. Um, Miami is in the same country as Dartmouth, but it's probably more similar to Brazil than it is to Hanover. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about Hanover, New Hampshire, that's the place where we're located, and I'll spend about 10 minutes talking about that. Um, yes, it's different, but it's not, you know, it's a different place to live, it's a different place to go to school, but it's not better or worse than other places, it's just that it's different, and I think it's important to highlight that. I'm gonna spend the most of the time, so you okay? Yeah, yeah, do you want to pass this? Like, no, 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 it's okay. I'm going to keep talking. I'll, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to spend the majority of the time on the third question, the third slides, which are talking about what. What makes Dartmouth unique, special, different from other institutions of higher education, um, especially elite competitive institutions like the other schools in the Ivy League and the other schools with very selective admissions rates. And Dartmouth is unique in, in a lot of ways, and I want to make sure that you understand that um, and give you some stories that help outline how it is that, that we're different. The last question, as I was just saying, is, is how. Um, and that's the part that even if you sit through the first part of the presentation and say, meh, dark myth, not really for me, uh, the how is gonna be how do we do selective admissions in the United States? I will use Dartmouth as the example, but I think the information, um, having worked at a few other very selective universities that offer financial aid um, to students from other countries, um, you know, institutions you've definitely heard of, I think it's helpful to just talk generally about how does this process work, and I'll give you some tips about each part of the application to guide you as you move through to so that you know that you're on the right track. Um, but I think that's that's basically what I want to talk about today, and so we should just get started while we're here. Um, so the first thing I like to spend five five ten minutes talking about is who are we at Dartmouth? Uh, what what's our history? So Dartmouth is one of the ten oldest institutions of higher education in the United States of America. We were founded before. The USA, so before we have, we're like, oh, let's have a revolution, start a country. We were like, let's have a school. We were going to have a brand new university. So 1769, the US uh, is founded in 1776. Um, we're, we're, we're founded with a charter from the British government to educate Native American students, uh, excuse me, Native Americans um, in the colonies, in the original colonies. So I think that's an interesting aspect of, of something we do. We have the oldest Native American studies program in the country. We have a, the biggest powwow every year for our region of the United States. So the history of the educating the Native American population about um, kind of academia and religion in this time period. It still is part of what we do today. We also have a large cohort of Native American students in our undergraduate population 
Um, large is relative. It's large compared to other Ivy League and private selected schools. Um, the other thing that I like to mention about Dartmouth is that we're known as a college. Um, so if you look at any of our things, uh, does your shirt say college? No, okay. Doesn't. All of our materials, though, if you see them, they don't say Dartmouth University. They say Dartmouth College. Um, that's very important to us. So Dartmouth, um, since its founding, um, has always been what's known as a liberal arts institution. Uh, so the idea of the liberal arts is that we want to give you a well-rounded education and make sure that you take classes in all different disciplines. So yes, you will have a major in an area you focus, but you will look at that passion and that interest from a variety of perspectives. Um, getting a liberal arts education is, instead of teaching you what to think, we're trying to teach you how to think. That's very important because the fact of the matter is, and this is a really, this is kind of deep moment to say this, I know it's like Friday afternoon, um, but you guys will retire, uh, assuming average lifespans hold, in the year 2060, 2070. Um, I know the world is a crazy place right now, so we don't know <laughs> what it will look like then, but the, the, the fact is you'll graduate from college 2021, 2022, 2023, and you'll retire in 2060, 2070. And the jobs you have, in 2030, 2040, and 2050, they haven't been created yet. So when we give you, when, when we say we offer a liberal arts curriculum, we're trying to prepare you for a world that's constantly changing. Um, you see Hoffa, what do you got? Let me see Hoffa on your phone. So like this device right here, this device. Uh, I'm not sure if they're seeing the, the camera right now. I was wondering about that because there's no green light. Yeah, I think they're only seeing the, the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so should we, can they hear me though? Yeah. Oh, okay, so we'll just, oh. Yeah. So they don't see you holding your phone. No. Okay, so Hoffa is holding an iPhone. And the iPhone is a fantastic piece of equipment, but the fact of the matter is in 10 years, the iPhone will be like, why do you still have that iPhone anymore? Like, that's such an old iPhone. Um, so if we were to teach you what to, what to know, what to think, we would say uh, to an engineer, you know, memorize the pieces that go into making one of these. And in 10 years, that knowledge would be obsolete. So we're trying to teach you how to think so that as you go out into the world, you're able to change jobs, you're able to kind of take on any challenges that come your way using the skill set, the toolbox that you get from a liberal arts education. So that's very important to our history, that's very important to our mission. Um, so that's the quick overview. Um, again, the thing about being a college as well is that uh, we are a university by definition, um, but the, the important thing about being a college is that we're focused on the undergraduate experience. So we don't change our name to Dartmouth University, even though we offer tons of research, which I'll talk about later on in the presentation, um, because we're so focused on the undergraduate experience. You see from the slide, we have twice the number of undergraduate students, that more than twice the number of undergraduate students and graduate students. That makes us very different from other schools in the Ivy League, where they have far more graduate students than undergraduate students. So when you come here, the faculty, they come first and foremost to teach, to work with students like yourself, like Hoffa, um, and to be in the undergraduate classroom, they're not coming here just to lock themselves up and write a book or be in the lab. Um, they do those things. They publish articles, journals, books. They're interviewed in New York Times and in El Estado de Sao Paulo, my newspaper up there. Uh, but they are, they're here first and foremost to teach. So that's very important. This is kind of our general overview, our general history, our general mission. So that's who we, who we are. Uh, moving forward, I want to talk about where we're located. So this is really important. You get some pictures, some flavor here. Hanover is what we call in the US a college town, right? It's a town that thrives off the existence of the university. Everyone can hear me, even though they can't see me, right? Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the college town experience is very different from going to school in a big city like Sao Paulo or Boston or Miami um, or New York. Uh, the, the university is very much the focus of everything going on here. That being said, we offer plenty of great opportunities. Um, first of all, the campus itself, I like to call it millennials paradise. Um, you have everything you could ask for as a young, you know, a millennial young kid, um, state of the art labs, state of the art, uh, performing arts center, athletic fields, gymnasium, all within walking distance. So no traffic like you would have in a lot of cities in Brazil. Uh, that's not a problem here. Um, you can get everywhere without a car and the campus is quite beautiful. Um, we're, what we like to say is we're framed by nature. So you see from the pictures, uh, the Connecticut River where the students are kayaking in the top photo um, runs right along the side of campus. You can walk five minutes down the road and you can take a kayak or a canoe. It costs $5. You pick it up and you go out on the river for the day with your friends during the warm months. Um, so that's pretty cool. We have mountains. You see in the bottom right picture, we have our own log cabins in the mountains. So Dartmouth is located in a town that runs along what's called the Appalachian Trail. 
the Appalachian Trail is the second largest mountain range. It's uh, the biggest in the east side of the Mississippi River in the U.S., so like on the east side of the United States. Um, and so you have skiing and snowboarding. I know Hoffa plans on learning how to ski yeah. um, next term when he can take classes on that. And Dartmouth students, they can just go on the bus in the morning, go to the mountain, learn to ski or practice skiing if they already know how, and come back and go to class that afternoon. So that's pretty special. In a lot of places in America and around the world, you can't go skiing in the morning, have lunch in the cafeteria, and then go to class all on the same day. Exactly. Um, so that's pretty unique. These log cabins you see in the one at the bottom host a lot of student retreats and student events. So clubs will go there. They're all run by students. They have um, dinners and games, and it's really like a fun bonding experience. For the students, you can obviously see the stars really well. So if you're interested in astronomy and that kind of thing, we have cool opportunities for that. Dartmouth also, because we're located in a town, we have our own farm. Um, the organic farm is a really cool opportunity if you're interested in sustainability, food chemistry, doing research about those subjects. There's classes on the farm. Um, you can do you can do internships on the farm and be paid for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the coolest thing for people like me, because I'm not a student, is you get to eat the food from the organic farm, which is always nice. Um, we, you see the bottom left picture. We have a farmer's market where farms from the whole local area bring their products during the the warm months and sell them and food and they have fresh like marmalade and jam and and fruits and vegetables and that kind of thing so it's really a, a group special place to go to school um because it's very different from going to school in a major city but it has kind of everything you need um, as well as a lot of natural beauty um the last thing i like to talk about our location is well okay we're a college town how do you get there especially if you're coming from brazil or like for me from miami um, the easiest way to get to to hanover is to fly to boston um, Boston Logan Airport we run a shuttle service that goes like, six seven times a day five days a week seven days a week 365 days per year from the campus to the Boston Logan Airport to Boston's main train station so if you wanted to travel in the region you could go there and back to campus the whole loop takes a little over two hours so it's not so disconnected from uh, a large American city um, it's just that it definitely is its own town so that same shuttle service also runs to New York City um, next, so next week, I'm actually going to New York City for, for a, an event that I have to do on Friday for work. And it's just I go on the shuttle and it drives down. That takes a little bit longer, maybe four or five hours. Um, but we're, we have access to two of the biggest, uh, most prominent American cities on the East Coast in Boston and New York. So that's pretty much where we're located. Hava, do you want to add anything about your experience living here coming from Brazil? Right. So I, I'm from Sao Paulo. It's a very, very different city. Uh, and I, I used to study in, a, in like two, 20 minutes away from Avenida Paulista. So uh, when I was coming to Dartmouth, some things that crossed my mind was like, what, what am I doing? I'm going to study in the middle of nowhere. But actually, when I came here, so I was I came here in April of this year. I'm freshman, so I came here to visit the schools that I got in. Uh, and I remember when I was uh, I was coming here in the, in the very moment that I arrived in my uh, my host's uh, dorm, he said, uh, "Put all of put all of your stuff over there and come with me, because I would take you to a very special place at Dartmouth." Uh, and at that day, uh, and that day. He took me to go kayaking in the Connecticut River. Uh, it was very funny because uh, when I realized what I was doing, I was in the middle of the river. I was looking at this sunset. Everything was so great. And I decided that that was the place that I wanted to, to study and to spend the four years of my life, even though I consider myself a city person. So I think Dartmouth is such a special, unique place. Uh, in I, my, if I have to give an advice for the students who are applying to Dartmouth, I, I would say, or are considering applying to Dartmouth, I would say don't trap yourself in a bubble uh, and say that uh, this is not for me. I mean, just try to like do your your research on it, and I don't know. Yeah. No, I think Hava makes a really good point. I, I as well, I'm 26. I'm a young guy. Like I've lived in cities my whole life. I've only lived in three places other than Hanover. Um, I lived in Miami where I grew up until I was 18. I, I went to university in Boston and then I uh, lived in Madrid, Spain for two years. So I've only lived in three very large cities and I'm loving my experience here in Hanover. I mean, there are just all kinds of unique things that you couldn't, I have never done before. Um, I moved here and I'm really appreciating that experience. Uh, like for example, the same as Hoffa, my first week here, um, I went in a kayak, which I had not done before because those major cities don't really do a lot of kayaking. Um, but then the coolest thing was we took the kayaks to a small island in the river and they have rope swings like Tarzan. So I was flying on a rope. So like I've never in my life, 26 years and I'm flying on a rope swing, like driving into the water. It was really just a fantastic experience. And I was like, wow, I kind of, uh, 
I like this a lot. And I went on, there's a lot of opportunities to go hiking. Um, and yet still, I, I go to Boston a lot of times on the weekends to visit my, my family and yeah, my friends. Yeah, just came there. back from New York and Maine. And yeah, Hoffa was just in New York last week. So it's got everything you could ask for, kind of. And, and when you're an undergraduate student surrounded by 5,000 other really young, ambitious, smart people, it doesn't feel like such a small place. It feels like there's lots of other uh, cosmopolitan type type people like you. Right. So that's that's the most of the location. Uh, now we'll talk about what makes Dartmouth um, kind of special, unique, different, apart from our, our history, our mission, and our location. Because I think I like to talk about those things first because I think you need to have that general overview. But now I'm going to get more into the nitty gritty of like the academic life and that kind of stuff. So Dartmouth is really, it's famous for being the smallest member of the Ivy League and for being focused on the undergraduate classroom experience. Um, you see Marcelo Geisner up there, Geisner up there. Um, in the right corner. We have faculty who are doing incredible research, who are, like I mentioned before, publishing articles and being interviewed in prominent um, journals and, and on big news sites. Um, but they come here first and foremost to teach. So we've been ranked in the top five for commitment to undergraduate teaching every year of the existence of this, this ranking, um, which is subjective, but it's just more just saying like, okay, we're identifying that Dartmouth is really good at, at teaching and undergraduate um, experiences. Um, the, the other thing that's great is that not only are we all about this classroom, liberal arts, lifestyle, but we have amazing research going on on campus. So we have over $300 million, $200 million in sponsored research, actually getting close to $300 million in research. And we have three incredible professional schools, the South School of Business, um, the Geisel School of Medicine, as well as the um, Thayer School of Engineering. And so all three of those institutions offer opportunities for undergraduate students which is fantastic. So if you want to take a couple classes in the Tuck School of Business, you can take up to three classes as an undergraduate student. And you can do, you know, maybe you're interested in entrepreneur, starting your own company when you graduate, you can do a class in entrepreneurship. Maybe you're interested in marketing or international finance, you can do courses in that. Um, so those are, those are fantastic opportunities. And then at Thayer and at the medical school, if you're interested in, in going to medical school, we have uh, different um, advising and programs and early admissions processes that will help you and guide you through those processes. Uh, Geisel is one of the only medical schools in the country that offers um, full financial aid for international students who don't have U.S. passports, which is pretty incredible. A lot of American medical schools don't offer financial aid to international students. Um, so that's really cool. And again, it's just such a much, the, the campus is so dominated by undergraduate students. A lot of the research that these professors are conducting are being filled by those under, by, by undergrads. So I know one great story is uh, a girl, a young woman who was a sophomore, was giving me a tour of the engineering facility uh, a couple weeks ago because we just have uh, some new things in the facility that I wanted to learn about to tell students. And I was asking her, oh, like, do you do research? What kind of research do you do? She goes, actually, I was very ambitious when I arrived here. I'm an engineering and pre-med major. And I emailed eight professors my first term of freshman year to see if like, one of them would give me a research position because I really wanted to do paid research as a freshman. And she said, of the eight, seven wrote her back the same week, and they all offered her an opportunity to do a shadowing tour of them doing their research um, right then as a first-term freshman, follow them around in the lab, see what they're working on, see their projects. And she ended up getting six job offers. So she got six job offers out of eight emails um, in the first term of freshman year. And so she said she felt bad that she emailed so many <laughs> and she should have narrowed it down before she emailed, but she was worried no one was going to answer her. So yeah, the majority of the labs are staffed by undergrads because they're the dominant population on campus. And so that's different from some of the other big, I, you know, the big research schools, the other IVs are more grad dominated. And so the access you get to the professors is not the same that you get at Dartmouth. Um, so that's a, a quick overview of, of a few things. I want to also talk about the D plan and how that affects um, undergraduate life and academic life here. So Dartmouth operates on, on the quarter system. We, we have a really creative name called the D plan, right? <laughs> like Dartmouth starts with a D. I uh, know, really outside the box. Um, <laughs> so, so the plan really is just that the, the, the class terms line up with the seasons. Um, for those of you like me from my, from, from places, seasons are things where the weather changes, <laughs> right? Like fall, winter, spring, summer. Yeah. Um, I know, I know in Miami we didn't have those. Um, we just had a rainy season and not rainy season. <laughs> so same Brazil. This, yeah, same Brazil, right? So the, the seasons line up with the terms. And so you have four different terms. You can see from the slide that you need to be on campus the first year and the last year of the term of your term. So you have to be, um, here taking classes the first year, obviously we want you to be acclimated with the university life, get to know other students, figure out what maybe 
what you're interested in studying, take some classes. And the last year we want you to come back in the senior year, reflect on that experience, um, think about how you want to go out into the world, make a difference and solve solve problems because that's what Dartmouth students do when they leave. Um, but the middle boxes in the white where it says you choose on sophomore and junior year, those are really important because those are where you're able to basically design your own curriculum. Um, so Dartmouth, you, you, at Dartmouth, you can study abroad starting your first su first year summer, which is much earlier than many other universities. Um, you can also do independent studies where you go out and do internships. You get uh, opportunities to, for example, one young woman I know is a history and theater major. She went to London in the fall of her sophomore year, and she did a project on the history of the West End, which is the like Broadway of London, and how did that influence the growth of London during the Victorian era. So she's like first term, um, fall year, she's out in London doing real field, field work and research. She came back, she was on campus um, for winter and, and for spring, and then in the summer sophomore, she worked here in our office. So the summer sophomore is, a, is another unique experience I can talk about after. Um, but then in junior year, she's going actually in the fall to be part of uh, an Upper Valley, which is the region we're located in, theater company. She's going to be uh, performing in a play for a few weeks, and then she's also going to be doing backstage work. So she's getting a real internship experience during that term. She's taking that as her term off, so she doesn't have to take classes. As you, you can see in the sophomore and junior year, you get to pick the term you have for vacation. In most universities, um, you have to do first semester on campus, then a break for the for the Christmas holiday, you know, the the holidays during the end of the year, and then you come back and then you're off for our summer. Um, here you can choose to the fall, I'm gonna go away and I'm gonna take this internship that I wouldn't have been able to do if um, it wasn't for the fact that I could leave in the middle of fall. At another university you can't do that. So she's acting, she's doing the backstage theater work, and then in the winter she's doing um, a, an experience where she's going to do a project for credit uh, through the National Institute of Theater, um, which is located in Connecticut. So that's really, really unique opportunities where she's creating individualized studies, which is another unique thing to Dartmouth. You can make your own class with a professor. So you go to the professor, you say, uh, this is my idea for a syllabus. This is my idea for the final project. This is what I'm thinking about studying. Um, you get their approval, they work with you, and you do a one-on-one -on -one class experience. And you can take that class anywhere. You could do it here, you could do it. She's doing it at the National Institute of Theater, which is in Connecticut, which is just the neighboring state from here. So that's one example. Another young man I know, he's an engineering student, engineering in German. So he did study abroad um, in Berlin, German language study abroad in the summer after the first year. So right away, study abroad experience. And then he got a position uh, doing an internship at Disney, being an Imagineer. So he's working on theme park design, graphic design um, for the new Star Wars theme park they're putting in Disney World. Um, now I know with the visa situation, you guys all can have paid internships, but what Dartmouth does offer is something called the Dickey Center. Mm -hmm. And through the Dickey Center, you can receive funding as international students to do any project that an American student would get paid for, and Dartmouth will pay you, because Dartmouth is the only institution um, in the U.S. If you're, or the college you attend in the U.S. is the only institution that can pay you if you don't have a U.S. visa and, or a U.S. Um, permanent residency or a U.S. passport. So we offer these opportunities so that everybody, international student or domestic student, can take advantage of the same the same things that whether no matter what their status is. Mm -hmm. So this is all kind of the things you can do with the D plan. You can mix it up. Dartmouth is number one in the Ivy League in study abroad. And I think there's two reasons for that. One, we have really amazing programs. We have a very big diversity of programs. You can go all over the world, do all different kinds of subjects. Um, you can study geography in Prague. You can study um, Africa. You can study economics in China or Buenos Aires. You can study German in Berlin. Like, there's over 60 programs you can look at our website. Um, and then on top of that, the D plan gives you the flexibility to say, okay, I want to study abroad in the fall of sophomore year and then again in the winter of junior year. Um, so you can pick those boxes and kind of design your own experience. It's very much a self-designed curriculum, which is really unique and different from most places. Um, Hafa, do you want to add anything to Yeah, that? so the Dick Center also offers uh, some funding for students who want to volunteer in other countries. So for instance, I'm planning on going to Nepal next uh, summer and to do volunteer work there. And Dickey Center would pay for everything. And it's very easy to get it. Uh, so every, that, that's why I think that's why most of Dartmouth students go and study abroad because it's so, so easy. And the plan offers this flexibility that uh, allows us to, to do all of this study abroad and, and take advantage of all the opportunities that uh, just to, to go abroad during our career here.
Yeah, and it's really, Dharma, we like to consider, our, consider ourselves the base camp to the world, right? So like our, we're very much, unlike some of our peers in the Ivy League who are kind of anti you, why would you leave campus? Because um, we are, have the best faculty, like why, why go anywhere? We're more like come here, learn something, find something you're interested, go out in the world and do it while you're an undergraduate and then come back and reflect on that experience and grow from that experience and maybe publish a paper or something like that. Um, so that's really, really something that's, that's us apart from other institutions that are similar to us. Um, I know another young woman, to the volunteer point, she was studying um, La Latino studies, like Hispanic, Latino and Hispanic studies in the Caribbean. And she did a project and, and public policy. She had a double major and she did a project on the Mexican American border where she went and was Dickey Center funded her. She volunteered for a whole term uh, working in a shelter for children who had come without, who had crossed the border without their parents. So if you, you might not know this, but in about four years ago, during the beginning of Obama's second term, um, there was a crisis in Honduras where a lot of children came by themselves without their parents across the border. And so these, they didn't know what to do with the children. So they were holding them in like kind of these refugee camps. And so she was working on what are the policies, the American policies that are causing this to happen in Central America and what, what, how is America affecting that with their own political system? And then what are we doing for these refugees and what is the policy we're going to have as far as like their status? Are we going to send them back? Are we going to make them residents? Are we going to give them asylum? And so she was doing that and volunteering at the same time. So she was looking at it from an academic perspective and also a humanitarian perspective, which is very much a Dartmouth thing to do. Right. Um, so, and she got all the funding for that through, through Dickey. So, um, I touched on this really briefly with that story, but the other thing that's very self-designed about Dartmouth is the majors. So what's cool about Dartmouth is you can create your own major, which you can't do in a lot of places. Well, you can do in a lot of places, but the fact of the matter is not a lot of students do it. At Dartmouth, 40% of students do what are called major modifications. Major modifications is kind of this choose your own adventure. So I know one young man, he came in, um, he just wanted to be a history major took some classes, he was liking it, and then he did a study abroad in Morocco, learning Arabic uh, in, in, during sophomore year, and he like got really interested in the influence of religion on governments in North Africa and the Middle East. So he modified history major with public policy and religion. And he talked about what is the influence of the theocracy and the blurred line between church and state on the government in Morocco and the government of Algeria as well, which is the neighboring country. Um, and he examined this, this, this phenomenon through this kind of modified lens. So we have majors, we have double majors, we have minors. You can do a triple major and you can just live in the library the whole four years. <laughs> um, but what's unique is this major modifications where you mix things together to focus them in. Um, and again, this is very much the point about Dartmouth being self-designed uh, experience. So uh, one other example I know is an economics major. He was, uh, you know, wanted to do finance, moved to Wall Street immediately after graduating. And then he took some classes in the um, education and sociology uh, departments and really loved them. And so he uh, modified economics with sociology and education. And he did a project examining uh, public funding for the public schools, uh, government funding for public schools in the U.S. So in the U.S., the, the public schools are run by the states. They're not run by the federal um, level. So each state has its own public school system. And so like he was looking at like for every dollar that Florida spends on their public schools, what are the outcomes for graduation rates, for attending college, for the testing, for the exam results versus every dollar that California spends and like which state is spending money the, like wisely and effectively and which states are not, which states are spending lots of money, but not getting the same results. So it was kind of an economics project with a sociology education bank, um, if that makes sense, which is really something special about Dartmouth as well. Right. Okay, so that's the general what makes Dartmouth different. Um, there's one more slide here. This is just about the study abroad. Um, I mentioned some of the programs. We have film um, in Edinburgh, Scotland, as well as uh, study programs in the United States. So you want to spend a term in Washington, D.C. looking at uh, politics. You can do D.C., po a political uh, study in D.C. We have uh, film as well. Not only in Europe, we also have it in Los Angeles. We have a lot of famous alumni from Dartmouth who are in Hollywood, and you can get internships and studios and stuff like that. So really unique. We have women's and gender studies in India. Um, we have engineering programs in Thailand. There's just so many opportunities. So I like to show this slide. Uh, the last thing I like to mention is internships. Again, um, I know you guys are not uh, U.S. citizens, so you're sometimes limited in where you can work. But Dartmouth offers funding if you do get an internship. 75% uh, of the student body does an internship at some point in their four years, and that's one of the highest rates 
um, in the United States. So that's really cool opportunities for you. Even if you're not a U.S. citizen, you can take advantage of them because Dartmouth will fund you for it. Cool. So that's the what makes us unique. The last thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is just like community and student life. I know Hoffa can speak to some of this, but you have some pictures here. We also, obviously, we have athletics. We have music. We have clubs. We have all kinds of organizations. Um, we were the champions last year. I like to say in football and football. Uh, so we won the Ivy League in American football as well as soccer, um, which I know is pretty popular in Brazil. <laughs> so they tell me. Um, we have all kinds of music clubs, um, you know, just really different acti activities, 350 clubs and organizations on campus. And if you don't find one in the 350 that you like, you can start your own very easily. Um, do, Hava, do you want to talk a little bit about anything you're involved in? Uh, so one of the things that I, I think that I already mentioned, but uh, I think what is cool about Dartmouth being so diverse and having so many opportunities is that you can always try something new. So for next term, I'm going to take a P class, uh, like a physical education class, uh, and I'm going I'm going to take a, this uh, ski class. And coming from Sao Paulo, I've never seen snow in my life. This is the first time it's snowing <laughs> outside. All right you have to do is look out the window right now. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, and, and I'm going to take a, a ski class. And it, I think I'm very excited about it. And that's something that I would never, I never thought about. Uh, uh, so, yeah, and there is also, uh, I, I did fencing. Uh, I dropped it, but it was very cool. <laughs> uh, there are, uh, like, I can play my flute in the orchestra. And there, I, I don't know, like, there's so, so many opportunities. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty cool. Place. Oh, and there's also a Brazilian Student Association here at Dartmouth that, you can, <laughs> that you can also attend. Uh, and we organize some e nice events, and we have Shohasku and Big Okay, you didn't invite me for that. <laughs> yeah, I need an invitation for the next one. I want to that. Yeah. So yeah, there, there, everything that I can think of that we we have it here. So that's it. I'm happy to answer some questions after, but that's the general presentation I like to give. I want to spend the last ten minutes talking about the part that you're probably most interested in, which is how. How do we do admissions um, here at Dartmouth and how does it work generally in the US? So you have some lists there of the requirements that we need for you to apply. Obviously, early decision deadline has passed, but you have regular decision coming up in a couple weeks. Um, we're on the Common App, which is pretty straightforward. But the way I like to talk about the admissions process is there's two parts to every application. I know there's a list of things up there, but really everything falls into one of two categories. The categories are data and voice. The data is divided into two parts itself. So I'll talk about the data first. The data is your transcripts and your test scores. Now, I use the word transcripts on purpose because in the US we have a term called GPA, which is like your, your grade averages. Mm -hmm. um, I say transcripts specifically for people, you know, for students like yourself as well, because what we're really looking at is your academic performance in the list of courses that you've taken. And we have people in this office that understand every form of of uh, transcript that we receive. So in the US, just within the United States, we have some states, like I mentioned earlier, states are um, all run their own education system. So like in the state of Florida, they have a six point GPA. And then in the state of Georgia, a 12 point GPA. And in California, it's out of a hundred points. So like in Brazil, I know you have like E's and B's and R's. And so and everybody's different. From zero to 10. And from zero to 10, right, you have the zero to 10 scale as well. And in France, it's zero to 20. And in one very progressive school in Pennsylvania, they give like emojis for grades. Like smiley, <laughs> really? smiley face, sad face, like sideways face. And I'm like, okay, what do I do with this? Um, so, so everybody's on a different, different schedule, uh, curriculum. So what I like to tell um, students is really what we're looking at is uh, three, three things. What courses were you offered? What courses did you take? And how did you do in those courses? That's really what we're trying to see. Um, and so just as you guys are probably all, you know, seen like, towards the end of your high school curriculum, um, we're just looking generally at did you challenge yourself? And within the challenges, did you succeed? Um, because the fact of the matter is that at some places, like, you know, students will get a perfect transcript, but they didn't take the hardest classes that they could have. Um, on the flip side, other students will take all the hardest classes and then they'll get a lot of grades that are not the best grades. So like, we're trying to look for that balance. Now, Dartmouth, obviously, a very competitive place. We want to see challenge, but you, know, you have to succeed in, in, within that challenge. So the transcript is one part of the data. The other part, obviously, is the testing. Um, the standardized testing, we take the SAT or the ACT. We don't um, prefer one or the other. So you can send whichever one you want. It, it, you can send both. Um, we actually super score the SAT, so we only look at your highest scores if you've taken more than once. Um, we'll only see the highest score. The computer, the way it shows it to me is just, which one did you get the highest grades on? Um, if you take the ACT, um, again, it will show us whichever one concord. We have like a concordance table that says like, 
this square in the ACT is this square in the SAT. Whichever one you got higher, that's the one we'll look at. So we're looking for your highest score the, the day you did the best. Um, and that's pretty much the whole data. It's just the transcripts and the testing. Now we get 22,000 applications about um, every year that number grows and about 75% are qualified based on the transcripts and the testing. So when I say qualified, it means they have the marks that show that they can do the work. They can succeed at Dartmouth. You know, they can pass the classes. So if 70% of 22,000 can do the work, but the acceptance rate is 10%, how do we go from 70% to 10%? That's where the data, I mean, excuse me, the voice comes in. That's the other part of the application. So the voice application is divided into a few parts as well. So it's um, the personal statement, the supplement, and the recommendations. So I'll talk about each of those and I'll give you some advice on each part. So on the, on the um, I'll start with the personal statement. On the personal statement, what we want, this is gonna seem self-explanatory, but what we're looking for is for you to be authentically personal. personal. Um, when I say that, I'm thinking, I'm, the, the, the tip I give people is if you took your personal statement and you took your best friend's personal statement or another person you know in the group who's also applying to American schools, took their personal statement and you gave it to somebody who knows you really well. You gave it to your teacher or your favorite teacher or your brother or your sister or somebody like that and they read it, they would know which one you wrote. Because the best personal statements, they reveal something about what it's like to be you. That's what, those are the best, the best kind. A lot of times students make the mistake of doing uh, one of two things. Either they try to tell me things they think I want to hear, um, which is not effective because um, it, you end up not sounding like your authentic self. Or uh, this happens sometimes, and maybe in your case this isn't something to worry about as much, but people edit it too much. So they get worried that, oh, like, I don't know if it's good. So Hafa, you read it. Um, you know, my, my mom reads it and my friend reads it and everybody reads it. And then after they've all read it and given notes, it sounds like seven people are talking to me in one essay. And it doesn't sound like you anymore. Um, so my, my tip is, again, to take your statement and another one and give it to someone who knows you really well. And they'll say, this is the one you wrote two paragraphs into reading. Um, and I'm happy to answer more questions about this after, but that's the personal statement and the personal statement is very important, but I also want to talk about the supplement. Um, Dartmouth has what's called the supplement where you have to answer questions specific to Dartmouth that other universities don't ask you to answer. This is very important as well because this is the part of the application where you can stand out and say, why is Dartmouth specifically your number one choice? Or with any other school with the supplement, why is that school your number one choice? Or why is that school a good fit for you? and why are you a good fit for us? Mm -hmm. um, so with the supplement, we ask you two questions. The first question is uh, Dr. Sh you know, you guys know Dr. Seuss, right? The, the English, the famous American mm, poem, maybe? It's not that famous. It's not that it's famous? Not. Okay, well, it's only it's famous in the US, only, yeah. maybe. Um, so Dr. Seuss is like this famous poet from the US, like a children's poet, and he writes a story, which I recommend everybody read. I used to use it when I was living in Spain, uh, teaching English. It's called, All the Places You'll Go. It's really a nice story. It's like written in a poem. Um, and so we asked you a question about um, all the places you'll go, where can Dartmouth take you? Where do you want Dartmouth to take you? Like, what is it about Dartmouth specifically, things that I talked about, things that you've heard about um, that makes you want to come to Dartmouth? Um, and again, why are you a good fit for us and why are we a good fit for you? Um, so that's just like 100 words, not a lot of writing. Um, and then the second question, we have a bunch of different options. So you can talk about, um, there's one that's Kermit the Frog, who's a famous character in the US, I don't know if you guys have Sesame Street. There's this like famous character in the US and he says it's not easy being green. Dartmouth, all of our colors are, oh, you can't see me, but <laughs> all of our colors are green. So we say, it's not easy being green, discuss this dilemma. Um, and it's open-ended, it's just like be creative. There's another one talking about the year of yes, um, where this famous person who graduated from Dartmouth, who's a Hollywood director and producer and writer, uh, talks about, she said yes to every, um, opportunity she was presented with that she normally would have said no to. Um, for one year, she just said yes to things that she would have tried to avoid doing. Um, she talked about how did that change her as a person. So we asked you to talk about what would a year of yes be like for you? So there's all these different questions and you can see them on the, on the Dartmouth website. Um, there's a bunch and the one that speaks to you the most is the best one to answer. So that's the supplement. Um, the last thing is the recommendations. And for the recommendations, um, we asked for a teacher uh, and a guidance counselor if you have one. If you don't have one, you can just send two from teachers, um, so that's okay. And uh, ideally from recent teachers, so like not somebody from like primary school, like someone for, who's taught you in recent, the last few years, 
Um, and then there's this little special thing that's only from Dartmouth that we have called the peer recommendation. Mm -hmm. And then the peer recommendation is somebody ideally within five years of your age, write about what it's like to be in a peer relationship with you. So, you know, yes, from the application, we can see how are your academics. Um, we can see from the teachers and from your writing, like what kind of person are you from an, uh, an academic perspective? But we want to know, like, what kind of friend are you? What kind of roommate will you be? Like, will you come and listen to me talk about my problems at lunch table uh, on Monday? <laughs> like, I make comedy. Like, are you going to be a good colleague? Or, like, do I want to be in study groups with you? Mm -hmm. um, so those are the things we're looking for with the peer recommendation. Um, the best peer recommendations, they're written by someone who knows you very well. Um, so a sibling or a cousin or a best friend. Um, so those are the best people to ask. And they have stories about things, you know, specific stories. Like, it's fine for them to say, oh, he's my best friend and he's really nice and he's really smart and he's really funny. Like, okay, but like, tell me a story about that. Like, show me what kind of person they are. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the peer recommendations. Um, and that's pretty much the, the, the talk. That's like most of what I want to tell you again about today. So you can, if you liked it, you can follow us on social media and I'm going to give Hoffa the link to sign you up if you if you want to sign up for like our mail list, like we're on Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. If you hated it, you can write about it on MySpace because then no one will read it. No, I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but yeah, so now I'm happy to answer questions you have. Um, but yeah, so you. what you can do is like just type in your questions on YouTube uh, so that you can read here. Um, let's see. Our Okay. Are we back on camera? Yeah, we are. No, almost. Almost back on camera? Yeah. Okay. Hey, there we yeah, are. There Hello, we are. everybody. So <laughs> you can type in the, the questions if you have any. Uh, I think it doesn't show here. Is it showing the YouTube? Sorry. Yeah, I guess. Uh, there isn't any question here, but there are some that I collected uh, previously. So one of the questions they asked is, uh, so in Brazil, there are three years of high school mm -hmm. and not four, like here in the US. Mm -hmm. So what they want to know is uh, if they have to ask their counselors to send the last four years of education or... They can send the three st it's stages, right? And like the first stage, second, something like that. Kind of. Yeah, you can just send the high school. It's fine. You don't have to ask for the extra. Right. So, so the, more, the more, the better. So if you can send it, send it, but you don't, it's not required. We just need your high school transcripts. Right. Uh, so the other question is, as we don't have GPA in Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, do the counselors have to uh, come up with a no, no, no. grade? No, it's OK. That's what I was saying before, that we look at your transcript and not your GPA. We look at, um, you know, your. I look at the whole performance. I'm not looking for one number. Because everybody has different systems. So it's fine to just send the whole transcript. They don't have to invent a, a number or a letter or something like that. Right, so it's same for class ranking, right? For class ranking, if they can provide it, they can. It's helpful. Um, but if, assuming that it exists, you know, like that's if there is a quantifiable way to say this person is X out of Y, then do that. But if they can't, then it's okay as well. Right. Uh, so I think uh, that's pretty much. Wait. That's as a general piece of advice, the more information, the better. Right. Mm -hmm. So like. Again, um, subject tests, not required. But if you want to submit them, they can help you if you do well. Um, they won't hurt you by not submitting them. But the more information we have, the easier it is to make a decision. Right. Uh, so there is a person who said, oh, OK, so there I have, have some question. questions, actually. Uh, oh, if that, oh, OK, I got some fun questions here. So my ECs need to be directly coordinated with my major. No, not at all. Extracurricular activities is what you like to do for fun outside of the classroom. Um, or with your extra time, doesn't have to be directly correlated to your major. You don't even have to pick a major. Hafa, what's your major right now? I don't know. Yeah. I decided major. This is the most popular major as the first year student. Right. It's totally fine um, not to have a major when you arrive, or it's, um, it's nice if you want to put on your uh, application things you think you might be interested in studying, but you're not required to pick one thing. Um, and your extracurricular is just. Whatever you do to fill up your time outside of school, just tell us about that. How do you, you know, do you play music? Um, do you do art? Do you play sport? Like, just tell us how you use your time because it's nice to know um, that information as well. If I could change one thing about Dartmouth, what do you see? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, I get, I'll give you two. For me, being from Miami, I would make winter a little shorter. Um, but on a more serious note, what would I change about Dartmouth? I would love it if Dartmouth was just a little bit bigger. 
Um, I think it would make my job easier if I didn't, if I could accept a few more students. And uh, being, we are the smallest member of the Ivy League by about 200 students. So if we could get a little closer, now I still like being the smallest, but maybe um, instead of 1,120 in each class, maybe 1,250. Um, I would love to add a few more students to campus. I think it would be cool. Um, so that's what I would change personally. Yeah, uh, I, do I think one? it's actually what makes Dartmouth so unique. Uh, so we were ranked uh, number one in uh, alumni net network, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think our community is so strong uh, because we are very because we are small. small. Yeah. So I think actually I I I like this way. I like Dartmouth. Oh, the fine, way fine. Is. But from an admissions officer perspective, I have to deny a lot of really good <laughs> students. So it would be cool if I could add a few more to the yes pool. But I understand. Right. Um. And again, I wouldn't want to make us. I would always want to be the smallest Ivy League school. I think that's very important. To who we are, I would just like maybe like 50 to 100 more <laughs> to make my job easier, but oh well. Okay, okay. fine. Um, yeah, Hoffa can say that because he's already been accepted. <laughs> um, I'll talk about the five year liberal arts engineering. Yes, so engineering is one of the most popular majors mm -hmm. here. Um, generally, the most popular program is actually the BA in engineering, which is four years. Um, the BA in engineering, our engineering program is very interdisciplinary. So we like to, to say that. Engineering is about thinking outside the box to solve problems creatively. So we don't want to put you in a box. Electrical engineer, you're a mechanical engineer, you're a chemical engineer. No, you're an engineer who has skills in all of these fields. So our engineering program is excellent. I know it's really popular with the students. Um, there's one course that they do uh, that explains uh, kind of how the curriculum is, which is that the curriculum is interdisciplinary, as I said, also very team-based. So there's one class very popular where they build jousting machines and they actually use kind of mechanical, physical engineering to build these machines. And then they go out on the campus and they joust against each other with the machines that they built. Some of them are walkers. Other than have like uh, kind of like tank tracks on them. And they are being judged on how well they move and whether now when they joust, they don't stab each other. Obviously, they have to hook like a ring that's on the other machine. So really cool project based. You do it with a group. Um, so that's the BA. That being said, we have this four plus one BS. Bachelor in Science and Engineering. Um, you can do it in four years, but it's a lot harder to get it done that quickly. Um, but it's generally a five-year program. And so with that, you can focus your engineering on something specific if you want. Um, so that's the BA and the BS. Um, hold on, I got a lot of things on and here. And if they but are in financial aid, uh, does it cover the fifth year? Mm, that's a really good question. Okay, I know your financial aid goes for four years. I'd have to find out for you about the financial aid for the fifth year. Right. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I know that you can get the BS in four years, so no matter what, it's possible. It's a little bit more um, classes that you have to take in order to fulfill it in four years, so that's why most people do it in five years. I have to get back to you on the financial aid okay. for that, but yeah, I can, I can write that on Facebook, and I can find out after the event. Um, the next question... Hi, Rafa, does Dartmouth have many students who have taken a gap year? Um, yes, so students will, will take gap years at times. Um, it depends on for what they want to do. I know the student who's working at Disney, he's planning to extend his internship for the full year. Now, Disney is paying him because he's an American citizen mm -hmm. um, for that year, and he gets free housing, um, and he lives. So he lives at Disney World, works at the Disney Park, and gets free passes whenever he wants. So he was like, I think I can extend this for a whole year. Uh, no, 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 of course you can. Um, yeah. So he's taking a gap year. So I know students do it. Do you want to comment on Yeah, I think he's uh, referring to taking a gap year before applying to university. Oh, of course, yes. You can take a gap year before applying and apply a, after, a year after uh, you graduate. That's no problem at all. A lot of students yeah. do that. A lot of um, students. Yeah, uh, yeah not, I mean, it's not the majority by any means, but there are students every year who are coming from gap years. Mm -hmm. And there are students who get admitted and then defer a year so they can take a year to do something, to work, to make money, or to do whatever they want, and then start the next year. So you can defer, all, you, you can defer your admission by one year if you would like. If you're it doesn't hurt his chances to get it, right? No. You, if you're admitted, like if you apply before January 1st, you're admitted, and then you say, I want to defer one year, we hold your spot for you. Right. Um, Let's see, what type of students is Dartmouth looking for? Um, I think I kind of talked about that in the hiring. Mean, there's no one specific type of student. I think generally we're looking for people who uh, think outside the box, who have a lot of potential, who want to help make the world a better place using their intelligence. Um, you know, we're looking for general, for kindness. Like, we're, you know, we're trying to make, um, we're trying to, to have smart, intelligent, ambitious students who also want to affect positive change. 
Um, but there's no one type of student. You know, we're, we're looking for, for diverse perspectives and diverse ways of thinking and diverse set talents and skills, um, kind of diversity in every sense of the term. Um, ethnically, racially, geographically, intelligence, like all, all kinds of students are should apply. Um, we Brazilians are not as encouraged as Americans to take a ton of extracurriculars. Is the admission committee nice about this part of the application when considering our application? Yes. So I was a teacher for three years, as I mentioned before. I actually taught in Spain for two of the years, uh, teaching in a public school in Madrid, Spain. And I know that as the person who's, in, who's uh, the manager of the territories in South and Central America who reads the applications, I know culturally that Brazilians, that students from other countries, that you guys don't have student councils and you don't have uh, a school basketball team and a school band and all these things. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you do, but a lot of times you don't. And yeah. so we don't judge you based on those on the American standards. So yes, we we will ju we judge your application in the context of your story, um, and that goes for everybody. That goes for a, every American kid. You know, it's very different going to high school um, in Miami versus going to high school in a small town in Kansas, right? So we judge everybody on the context of where they're from and their culture and their, their experience. We're not going to make you go against, you know, an American student who has all these different clubs and sports that he's in or she's in that you guys don't have available to you. Um, you mentioned Guidelines School of Medicine's financial support for international students. Is it possible for Dartmouth for international students to study medicine? Yes, you can do um, the pre-medical program is one of the most popular tracks of study at Dartmouth. Um, so it's not a major, it's just a track. And what it does is it's a list of courses that prepares you to go to medical school, but it's not, um, you can major in anything. So popular choices of major for those pre-medical students are biology, chemistry, biochemistry, engineering, but there are students who study anthropology. There are students who study art. There are students who study theater, and then they do the pre-medical track as well. Um, so it's just a list of courses. Um, now, being an international student and going to an American medical school is definitely not easy. It's definitely, it's a difficult process because the American system is very complicated, but we do offer the financial aid. Um, it's there. So uh, I know one student who's from Mexico, uh, who's in the medical school right now and he is not an American citizen and he's got financial aid from Dartmouth for that. Um, that's, that's very cool actually okay. because in the group, we, okay, whatever. Okay. Sorry. We'll keep going. Um, hi, Ronan, just by Dartmouth, so in love and he's so excited for the 14th. I want to know how is it for uh, uh, ED candidate to be deferred? Ah, so if you're deferred, um, what happens is we will roll your application into the regular decision pool. So we got the um, applications on November 1st um, from all, you know, by November 1st from all of you. And we've been working on making decisions on those. We're not finished yet, um, but we will be in a few days, uh, the 14th, as you noted in your question. Um, and if you're deferred, what happens is you're not um, denied, but you're also not accepted. So we will put you into the regular decision pool which is coming up on January 1st and we will read your application in full again and we will make a new decision on it either accept or deny we will not wait list you off of a deferral um, mm -hmm. generally so we will make that decision in the regular decision time as opposed to making it in the early decision time I'd also like to talk quickly because I didn't about financial aid at Dartmouth um, so Dartmouth is what's called need aware we've recently changed to need aware for international students. So that means when, when you apply to Dartmouth, we generally know, we know because you submit this documents, how much money it will require you to afford a Dartmouth education. Um, so that's something we take into account when making decisions for international students. It's different for US students. That being said, we do offer full demonstrated need, 100% of demonstrated need um, scholarship to the international students if they're admitted. So once you're accepted, um, if you're accepted, we will offer, if you need the full tuition, $65,000 to afford a Dartmouth uh, education, we give you the full tuition. We don't say, oh, you need 65,000, here's 20,000, now you have to find 40,000 for yourself. Um, we don't do that. Uh, so that's very important to keep in mind. We have um, plenty of financial aid for international students. The only thing is we need to know before we make the decision how much it's going to require because we don't have, it's not an unlimited budget. Um, there's a there's a, a limit to that, to that resource. Right. So... Yeah, I think. Oh, you mean what makes a candidate to be deferred? Sorry. I mean, what makes a candidate to be deferred? And what makes the deferred candidate accepted in an RD cycle? I know. Okay. So, uh, what makes a candidate be deferred is uh, it's a variety of factors. We only have so many. We don't want to use, you know, we have enough applications in early decision to fill the whole class if we want to. But we don't want to do that. So, we try to limit ourselves in how many students we accept um, during early decision. Um, so there's a number of factors that go into making 
those decisions. It's a holistic process, as somebody mentions in another question. So we're looking at your data, we're looking at your voice, we're trying to, um, in, in an individualized context, make a decision about your application. Um, if you are deferred, um, it's important to just stay in contact with us, mention that we're, you're still interested um, in coming. Um, you know, if you decide, you know, at Dartmouth, maybe it wasn't for me, you can withdraw your application, but uh, update us on any grades that you get or new test scores that come in um, or any awards that you receive. And we will reevaluate you in the larger pool. Um, there's no, uh, you know, defers. Often our competitive students who we just decided we couldn't, um, you, you know, we didn't have the space for during the early decision process because it's such a limited um, pool that we take an early decision because we don't want to give away all the seats uh, before the regular decision round. I know the process is a list, but I've heard from some of these students I didn't even analyze student with an ACT score below 30. For example, is that true for Darwin? That is not true. Um, I know there are students here who did not get a 30 on the ACT. There are no, I'll tell you this, generally speaking, there are really no score cutoffs. I mean, we want to know that you can do the work because um, the fact of the matter is um, the, the idea behind the SAT and the ACT and the TOEFL and testing is that it predicts how well you will do in your first year of college. That was what the intention of using those tests are. Now, the correlation between, if you want to go scientific for a second with me, the correlation between the um, SAT or a standardized test score and your grades is about a 0.5. Um, which is the same as your transcript and your freshman grades, right? So I'm talking about, uh, it's about a, a, a medium correlation, if you guys know anything about statistics. But when you combine the two, so think about the holistic process, standardized testing and transcript together, that is actually about a 0.7 when it comes to predicting your grades as a freshman in, in university. That's what's important. So we use those to make sure, can you succeed at Dartmouth? Because the fact of the matter is, and how fucking they test this, it's not easy, right? It's a challenging curriculum. And so we don't admit students, no matter, even if they're really good people who we think maybe can't do the work. Um, do you want to comment any more about the work level here? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> for, for, for instance, um, I just, this term, I took uh, Chinese and it's a very fast paced class and it's a very hard class as well because you have to memorize all the characters. And um, I, I figured out that Chinese is, is very, very hard. And I was thinking like, Oh, after my first term, after taking the three classes that I took, I was like, mm, that, that's why they call it Ivy League school. It's, <laughs> it's very hard. Uh, so it's not easy. Uh, if you want to come to Dartmouth, you have to be prepared and you have like, to be uh, aware that it's, it's not going to be just, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like getting snowmans in a, in a minute. And, <laughs> we know, do that, but not, we have to study as well. <laughs> yeah. And you have to spend most of your time studying here because that's, that's why you're coming, you want to come here, right? So uh, what is more important, SAT or SAT subjects? Um, the, well, we require the SAT or the ACT, so that's really important. The subjects are optional. You don't have to submit those. Um, if you are able to submit those, that's great. Go ahead and do so, but it's not required. So. There's, it's not that the ACT is more important, it's just that's the thing that we require. Um, how much of the financial aid weighs on the decision of international students, if possible, a zero to 10 scale? <laughs> I can give you a zero to 10 number, um, but the fact is like, we, th there's only like five or six universities in the, in the country who are need blind and meet full demonstrated need for international students. So we still meet the full demonstrated need, which for us is the really important part. Like if we accept you, we want you to come. But we have to make these decisions strategically. Now, we have, um, you know, a lot of students here from international backgrounds who have financial aid, um, but we have to use that resource wisely because there's not an unlimited amount of money to give out um, when it comes to scholarships. So uh, there's no, like, one factor. It's a holistic process. So everything is being weighed um, when we look at those applications. Uh, how did the admissions committee see a student who includes the additional comments? Placing in a brilliant entry exam, would you recommend doing that? Um, if you want to give us that context, that's that can be helpful for you. If you want to tell us about how you did, it's obviously it's not required. Um, if you want to try to use that additional info box to explain any of your other um, kind of academic achievements that we're not aware of, or something about your school specifically to give us an understanding, because we don't know every school in Brazil, obviously, um, that's more than you're more than welcome to do that. And th like I, I come back to the more information we have, the easier it is to make a decision. So the more information you can provide us, the, the easier our job, the easier you're making our job, which we appreciate. Yeah. Um, I think that's yeah, all the questions. Yeah, there's another one, like, uh, what is more important, SAT reasoning or subject tests? 
Oh no, he's I I answered that SAT okay. or SAT yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and but between the two sections, there's not one that's more important than the other. I mean, it's looked at as a whole as holistic the whole score. Process, yeah, yeah, holistic process. Everything, you know, there's no there's no one fit one score that's going to get you in. There are people who get perfect scores and don't get in, and there's no score that's going to necessarily keep you out. Right? So we're, we're it's everything is being judged together. There are plenty of people who get 800, 800, 800 on all the tests, SAT tests, 800 on all the subjects, perfect TOEFL, and they don't get, and don't need financial aid, and they don't get admitted. The fact of the matter is, it's competitive, 10%, remember, and it's holistic. So we're looking at you um, in so many different ways. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I that think that's it. it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys very much. Um, you have Papa's contact. Um, he has my contact. So if you need anything else, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Right. Um, but thank you for having me. Yeah, there is one last question. That oh, I, one last that question. Do I have to send it? Yes, yes. Please send your official report. Um, you can get uh, the fee waived for, the, for sending the SAT if you contact us. But we need to see the official report in order to know that um, we, we don't do only self-reported scores. So you can be admitted without the official one, but you have in order to matriculate and attend, you need the official result. SAT score. Yeah, SAT. the official results. Okay, so, uh, obrigado, gente. Uh, obrigado. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So if you have any more questions about Dartmouth, you can send to me and I, I, can, I can try to answer them. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah.